In my structural engineering made simple series, today I talk about design of bearing walls. This is part two of a two part series and focuses on concrete walls. Please take a moment and read the disclaimer at the bottom of this slide before we continue. Bearing walls made up of masonry or concrete provide support to roofs and floors. They are generally used as backup walls. However, in some buildings they may also act as a facade. In most modern applications, these walls are reinforced as explained later. This is part two of a two-part lesson on design of bearing walls. It focuses on walls made up of concrete. For masonry wall design, please watch lesson 13 of my series on the structural engineering made simple. This lesson primarily covers walls that are under the application of the floor and roof loads, identification of the types and sources of damage, and common repair methods that can be prescribed as part of the building envelope rehabilitation. These are the references used in the preparation of this video. In particular, please pay attention to reference one which is highlighted in red, Building Code Requirements for Structural Concrete ACI 318-14. The loads on bearing walls generally consist of dead, live, and snow loads transferred from the roof and floors. These loads will usually result in an axial load applied on the cross section of the wall. Lateral in-plane loads from wind and seismic effects. These loads are often prevalent when the wall is also acting as a shear wall. Out of plane forces. These are present when a lateral force acts perpendicular to the wall plane or when the axial compression load on the cross section is eccentric. An example of a lateral force applied perpendicular to the wall plane is when a wall is subject to soil pressure, such as for example in a basement wall as shown in this figure. As you can see, a portion of the wall is underground which is subject to the soil pressure. This figure taken from ACI 2014 shows all possible loads on a bearing wall. You see in-plane shear, axial force, in-plane moment, out-of-plane shear, out-of-plane moment, and a self-weight. The vertical direction as specified in ACI is along the height of the wall. The horizontal direction is along the length of the wall. Reinforced concrete walls are gaining popularity as facades because of their strength, durability, and appeals in aesthetic architectural design. It is noted that in many applications, concrete panels are used as facades. However, this lecture covers reinforced concrete walls and not concrete panels or tilt-up panels. While inspecting facades, you may encounter a load-bearing concrete wall in the following applications. Basement walls that are partially above ground. Facades used as shear walls. Facades that act as retaining walls in areas where garden or outdoor facilities are blended with the exterior of a building. And in green walls. Design requirements for most load-bearing reinforced concrete walls follow the provisions of the American Concrete Institute, for example, ACI 2014. These provisions are generally embodied in Chapter 11 of ACI 2014 and cover a variety of conditions, including most bearing walls. Walls that sustain lateral soil pressure, such as retaining walls, pre walls, and precast walls are covered elsewhere within the ACI code. 
The materials covered in this lesson are primarily applicable to the design of non prehistoric cast-in-place walls. Important parameters in concrete wall design are the effective length used in analysis and design for load computations, minimum wall thickness requirement, the slenderness effect, the minimum reinforcement detailing and spacing requirements, simplified method of axial load resistance computation, shear resistance, Please note that in seismic areas, there are special provisions to ensure strength and ductility requirements for concrete wall design as stipulated in ACI 2014. Effective length. As expected, concrete bearing walls are primarily under the application of a series of concentrated loads that are mainly the reactions of loads from floor and roof beams. In this figure, you see concentrated loads shown as R, which are the reactions of the beams. The effective length is shown with LE. According to ACI 2014, the horizontal length of a wall considered as effective for resisting each concentrated load is limited by the smaller of the center to center distance between loads and the bearing width plus four times the wall thickness. As you see in the footnote, the bearing width is the width over which the load R applies. Furthermore, the effective horizontal length for bearing cannot extend beyond vertical wall joints unless design provisions for means to transfer forces across the joints. This may include, for example, horizontal reinforcing bars placed at vertical joints. Please notice that over the effective length, the load would be considered as a linear load. The value is Q, which would be R divided by LE. Let's look at an example. A six inch thick wall supports a series of concentrated loads spaced at every 18 inches. The bearing width for the floor or roof joist is four inches. The factor total reaction from each joist is 570 pounds. We want to compute the effective width and the factor linear load in pounds per foot on the wall. The effective horizontal length is smaller of 18 and 28 inches. The 28 inches is obtained from 4 inches, which is the width of the floor or joist, the bearing area, plus 4 times the thickness of the wall. Therefore, the horizontal length, the effective horizontal length is 18 inches. In this example, thus we can use 18 inches of the length of the load under a concentrated load. The factor linear load per foot of the length of the wall is therefore QU is equal to RU divided by 18 inches, which is one and a half feet, when RU is a factored load. And that value was 570 divided by 1.5, we have 380 pounds per foot. Minimum thickness. The minimum thickness for a concrete wall is 1 25th of the lesser of unsupported length and unsupported height of the wall, however it cannot be less than 4 inches. As an example, let's take the unsupported height above the same as the height of the, say, roof to the ground in a one-story building, about 14 feet in a given building. For an unsupported horizontal length of about 20 feet, the minimum wall thickness will be 14 times 12, converting feet in inches, divided by 25, which is 6.7 inches, which is larger than the minimum of 4. Notice that if the wall is part of the exterior basement or foundation of the building, then the minimum thickness is 7.5 inches. This example shows what we are talking about. Simplified wall design. In general, 
The ACI requires a complete design of a wall for all possible forces, including bending moments, developed as a result of eccentric or out-of-plane forces, axial loads, and in-plane as well as out-of-plane shear forces. When there is a possibility for a slenderness effect, and this would generally be the case in tall, thin walls under very heavy axial load, the applied bending moment will need to be magnified. This is similar to the design process used in reinforced concrete columns. However, in most usual cases, the loading is limited to the floor and roof loads, which act as compression forces along with in in-plane shear forces when the wall is acting as a shear wall also. If the resultant of all axial loads, let's say P, applies within the one-third of the middle section of the cross-section of the wall, then ACI follows, uh, I'm sorry, ACI allows using a simplified design process based on the axial load only. When the resultant of all axial loads applied within the middle third of the cross-section, the load eccentricity E will be less than H over 6. This can easily be demonstrated using the equation that represents the axial stress on the wall cross-section. For a wall section with the thickness H and effective length LE, as shown in the figure, the lower portion of this slide, the stress on the cross-section is F equal to P divided by A plus or minus PE divided by SX where P is the axial load and E is the eccentricity. The positive sign in this equation indicates compression stress, while the negative sign means tension. Furthermore, area A is equal to Le times H, where H is the thickness of the wall, and section modulus Sx is I divided by H over 2 where I is the moment of inertia equal to Le h cubed divided by 12. When we plug these values in the equation for the stress, F is equal to P divided by Le h times 1 plus or minus 6 e over h. If the term 1 plus or minus 6 e over h becomes negative, there will be a tension stress developed in the section. Therefore, to avoid any tension stress in the section, the eccentricity E will need to be less than H over 6. This simply means that the point of application of the force P has to be within the middle one-third of the cross-section, as shown in the figure. The middle one-third portion of the cross-section is shaded in this figure. Using the simplified method, the nominal axial load resistance Pn is computed using the following equation, which is equation 11.5.31 of the ACI 2014. Pn is equal to 0 0.55 of prime sub CAG times 1 minus KLC divided by 32 H the quantity squared. In this equation, a prime sub C is a compressive strength of concrete in PSI. AG is a gross area of the wall which is the product of the effective length and the wall thickness h in square inches. k is a slenderness factor, which depends on the wall and the conditions and lateral supports. L sub c is the height of the wall in inches. Please note that ACI indicates this parameter as a length of compression member. The length refers to the dimension in the direction of the compression force which in the case of the wall will be the height of the wall. The value of the parameter k for most ordinary cases can conservatively be used as 1. However, ACI provides k for different boundary conditions. This table shows different values of k. In particular, Please pay attention to walls braced at top and bottom against lateral translation and run on restraints against rotation at both ends. That's the usual case we are talking about. Using the strength method, 
proper design requires that piece of u which is the factor of applied load be less than phi capacity reduction factor multiplied by p and the nominal strength The PU, which is the applied total factor compression force, is over the effective length of the wall. The resistance reduction factor in most applications is 0 0.65. Let's look at an example. We have a roof system made up of joists spacing 30 feet, each and a space at 2 feet, and they are supported by concrete concrete walls of 14 feet in height and 8 inches in thickness. This figure shows the walls providing spans for the beams which are 2 feet apart. The distance between walls is 30 feet nearby the span length of the joists. The roof is used as a recreational deck and as such it has a design live load of 100 PSF pounds per square foot. That's per city of Chicago requirements. The dead load, DL, including the joist face and finishing is 25 pounds per square foot. The governing load combination will be 1.2 times dead load, 1.6 times live load. The tributary width for the load on each joist is 2 feet. That's the spacing between the joists. We want to compute the factor of the applied load piece of U over the effective length of the wall, including the self weight of the wall. We also want to compute the nominal resistance Pn and decide whether the wall design is acceptable. The factor of uniform load QU on each joist is 2, which is a tributary width, times 1.2 times the dead load plus 1.6 the live load. The answer is 380 pounds per foot. Therefore, the reaction as a simply supported beam is QUL divided by 2. The answer is 5,700 pounds. Now considering a bearing width of 4 inches for each joist and a wall thickness of 8 inches, the effective length of this wall for a stress computation will be a smaller of 24 inches and 36 inches. To compute the factor of the compressive load, we also need to compute the weight of the wall. The weight over the effective length of 24 inches will be Considering 150 pounds per cubic foot concrete density and 8 inch wall as 1.2, which is a load factor, times 2, times 14. Remember, 2 is 24 inches, the effective length of the wall. Multiply the wall thickness, which is 8 inches, divided by 12 to convert in feet. Multiply by 150, which is the density of the wall. The answer is 3,360 pounds. Therefore, the factor of compression load is a summation of 5,700 plus 3,360. The answer is 9,060 pounds. Using the equation for Pn, and considering K equal to 1, H equal to 8 inches, LC, height of the wall as 14 by 12, which is 168 inches, and A sub G as 24 inches by 8, 8 is the thickness, and a prime sub C equal to 4000 PSI, we come up with the PN equal to plugging those numbers in the equation as 240,488 pounds. The resistance reduction factor phi is equal to 0 0.65 for a compression member. Therefore, the factor resistance of the wall is 156,317.2 pounds, and we designate that as phi Pn, which is certainly larger than the factor total applied load, therefore the wall thickness is acceptable. Wall reinforcement. Walls need to be properly reinforced to provide for resistance in bending and compression, and resistance in shear, and also ductility. Depending on the type and forces applied, the reinforcement design may require detailed structure analysis following the ACI provisions. For example, 
in seismic areas when walls are subject to in-plane and out-of-plane forces, the process is more involved and requires a detailed structure analysis to ascertain adequacy of reinforcement design and detailing. In most ordinary applications, when walls are primarily used as load-bearing systems with a low to moderate in-plane shear force, the reinforcement design may only require a minimum amount as prescribed by the ACI code. One of the key parameters in deciding whether the minimum steel is adequate for the bearing wall is the factor applied in plane shear force vis a u. In most ordinary cases in low rise applications where the wall is also used as shear resisting system, the value of VU can easily be computed following the recommendations of codes and standards such as the ASC 7 and the IBC 2017. These documents provide basic information in regard to parameters that determine lateral forces based on regions, soil condition, importance of the structure, the severity of the intensity of the natural event causing lateral forces on the building, and the distribution of the lateral force by floor levels. The wall reinforcement is made up of both horizontal and vertical bars. The concrete cover for the protection of bars is specified as follows. If the wall is exposed to weather or in contact with ground, for number 5 bar size and a smaller concrete cover is 1.5 inches. For number 6 to 18 bars, concrete cover is 2 inches. If the wall is not exposed to weather and not in contact with ground, Concrete cover is 0.75 inches. If the wall is cast against and permanently exposed to ground, concrete cover is 3 inches. If part of the wall is below ground, this will be the case, so we need to pay attention to that. With these definitions, the concrete cover for a bearing wall can then be equal to 0.75 inches on the interior and 2 inches on the exterior side. However, notice that these are minimum covers, and for simplicity, the cover can be taken as 2 inches on each side as long as it is not exceeding H over 3, but as you recall, H is the wall thickness. The placement of horizontal and vertical bars is generally in the form of two grids or curtains, one in front and one in the back face. Exceptions to this requirement are for walls that have a thickness less than 10 inches, are not used as retaining walls, and are not basement walls. Steel ratios. Walls that meet the requirement on axial load eccentricity limit of E less than or equal to H over 6 and the resistance given by the simplified equation for Pn can be designed for a minimum reinforcement. The minimum steels are vertical steel in inches square inches per foot is shown as ASV, which is rho L times BH. Horizontal steel in square inches per foot is ASH equal to rho T times BH. In these equations, B is equal to 12 inches. Rho L and Rho T are the vertical and horizontal steel ratios, respectively. Please note that the steel ratio Rho L is designated by ACI as longitudinal steel and Rho T as a transfer steel. For cases where V sub U, remember V sub U is a factored applied shear force, is less than 0.5 phi V sub C, where V sub C is the nominal shear resistance of the wall, and phi is the shear resistance capacity reduction factor. This table provides the steel ratios rho L. By the way, phi is equal to 0.75 for shear. Different types of wall is shown here, including cast in place and precast. 
n for bar sizes and different fy fy is yield capacity of steel rho l and rho t are provided in particular pay attention to common values we are usually using number five or smaller bars and with fy of 60,000. so rho l is 0 0.0012 and rho t is 0 0.002 the same goes for using prefabricated wires For cases where V sub U exceeds 0.55 V sub C, the values of steel ratios must meet A and B, which are given below. A, the value of rho L is taken equal to at least the larger of the value calculated by the equation given below. This equation, by the way, is equation 11.6.2 of ACI and 0.0025 but need not exceed rho t in accordance with the table given the previous slide here is a table again for your quick review the equation for rho l is shown in there has to be at least equal to 0.0025 plus 0.5 times 2.5 minus hw over lw the quantity multiplied by rho t minus 0.0025. B, the value of rho t is taken at least equal to 0.0025. In the equation that we just gave, hw over lw is a ratio of the wall height to wall length. For values hw over lw larger or equal to 2.5, rho l is equal to 0.0025. And for HW over LW smaller than 0.5, rho L and rho T become identical. Bar spacing. In practice, the steel is designated by the bar size and spacing. However, there are limits on the spacing as described below. For vertical reinforcement, for casting place walls, the spacing SV is less than 3H and 18 inches, whichever is smaller. If the in-plane shear force is sufficiently large that the wall requires shear reinforcement, the spacing of the vertical reinforcement also cannot exceed LW over 3, in which LW is the length of the wall that is resisting the in-plane shear force. For horizontal reinforcement, for casting place walls, the spacing H is less than 3H and 18 inches also. If the in-plane shear force is sufficiently large that the wall requires shear reinforcement, the spacing of the horizontal reinforcement also cannot exceed LW over 5. Let's look at an example. The total steel needed in a concrete wall of 11.5 inches of thickness is 0.17 square inches per foot vertical and 0.28 square inches in foot horizontal. If we use number three bars, we want to determine the spacing. Since the wall thickness is larger than 10 inches, we must use two curtains of steel. For vertical, we divide the total steel by two, so we get 0.085 for each face. For horizontal, 0.28 divided by two, we get 0.14 square inches per foot on each face. Because each number 3 has 0.11 square inches of area, therefore SV, the spacing of the vertical reinforcement, is 12 inches times 0.11 divided by 0.085, which is 15 and a half inches, is smaller than 18 and 3 so we are okay. And the horizontal spacing is 12 times 0.11 divided by 0.14, which is 9.4 inches, which is also smaller than 18 and 3h is okay notice that in our equation 0.11 is the cross-sectional area of a number three therefore we're going to use a number three at 15 and a half inches on center for vertical on each face and number three at nine and three eighths of an inch on centers in the horizontal on each face and here is a detail showing the reinforcement for this wall Please notice that we are using two inches of protection cover and we are assuming the wall is not exposed to soil. Wall shear resistance. 
The shear resistance against in-plane shear forces when the applied load on the wall is in compression is obtained from this equation. V sub C equal to 2 lambda square root of prime sub C HD. And we're using pounds and inches in this equation. The parameter lambda is equal to 1 for normal weight and 0 0.7 for lightweight concrete. The dimension D is 0 0.8 LW and is measured along the length of the wall. And the H is the thickness of the wall, of course. If the force on the wall is in tension, VC can conservatively be taken as zero. This condition usually does not happen in bearing walls in most ordinary situations. It may be a prevalent case when the wall is under a very small axial load and is subject to a very large potential lateral force from, for example, an earthquake. Let's look at an example. This figure shows the view of a one-story building used as a restaurant. Notice that in a north-south direction, the length of the building is 54 feet. In the east-west direction is 28 feet. We have roof beams spanning over 54 feet. The south and north wall are 11 inch thick reinforced concrete carrying the entire roof load. The roof is used as an open seating area with a dead load of 30 pounds per square foot and a live load of 100 pounds per square foot. The snow load is estimated as 22 pounds per square foot. The height of the walls is 18 feet measured from the foundation to the top of the parapet wall with 5 feet of the wall below the grade. The height of the parapet wall is 3.5 feet. The north and south walls are working as shear walls against an east-west wind pressure of 20 pounds per square foot including all necessary factors, such as cost factors and shape factors and so on. The resistance of concrete at prime sub C is taken as 3,000 pounds per square foot. We want to determine the factored axial and in-plane shear loads considering the most critical load combination according to ACI for the north and south walls. Using the simplified method, we want to determine the factored axial load capacity and decide whether the wall thickness selected is acceptable. We want to design reinforcement for the wall using number four bars. So let's first examine all possible load combinations prescribed by the ACI. We mark with red all loads that are involved in our case, but we're going to list all possible loads in a general case. So here are all possible loads. There are 10 different loads and there are seven combinations. Those are marked with red are the ones that are prevalent in our example. But in general, D is a dead load. E is the earthquake load, F is the fluid loads, H is the weight and lateral pressure of soil and water in soil, L is the live load, LR is the roof live load, R is the rain load, S is the snow load, T is called the self-straining force such as contraction or expansion due to temperature change, shrinkage, moisture changes, creep, or differential settlements. And W is a wind load. So considering the loads that are prevalent in our case, we only have four combinations as shown. What we do next is compute the value of D, LR, and W and plug them in the equations to compute the most critical load. Notice that the load combinations indicates LR or S and then we don't show the S in here because if you recall LR is 100 and S was 22 therefore S is not going to be critical.
The procedure is embodied in three steps. First, compute the axial and shear forces on the walls individually for the dead load, live load, and wind load. Then apply load factors to the three loads. In other words, the dead load, roof live load, and wind load, and compute the axial load and shear forces based on the four combinations. And finally, select the maximum value for the axial load and the maximum for shear as final factored values. There are a couple of observations before we continue. The dead load and live load do not cause in-plane shear forces in the walls. However, the wind load, when transmitted to the walls, produces axial loads in addition to shear. So let's compute axial and shear loads from the dead load and the roof live load. The tributary width for gravity load on each wall is 55 4 feet divided by 2, which is 27 feet. We assume the roof beams spanning over 54 feet are close enough such that the roof loads are linear load throughout the length of the north and south walls. Therefore, we do the calculations for one foot of the length of each wall. The axial load due to the roof dead load is 27, the tributary uh, width multiplied by 30, which was the dead load, so it's 810 pounds per foot. The self weight of each wall is 18 by 11 divided by 12, that was the thickness of the wall, multiplied by 150 pounds per cubic foot, which is the density of concrete, so it's 2,475 pounds per foot. Therefore, the total dead load is 810 plus 2,475, which is 3,285. The unit is pounds per foot. For the live load, again, we have 27.5 feet multiplied by 100 pounds per square foot. We get 2,700 pounds per linear foot. And of course, there is no shear from the dead load and the roof live load. The shear is equal to zero. Let's look at the wind load. We have an axial load and shear from the load W. At the roof, the wind in the east-west direction will create a force equal to one half of the total pressure. This is shown in the following figures. The upper figure shows you there is a force F applied on the east-west direction. Approximately, it could be taken that F over 2 is going to the roof, F over 2 goes to the ground. If you look at the lower figure, we see that there is a diaphragm shown. So our assumption is that the roof framing is properly designed with horizontal bracing, lateral and diagonal, to act as a diaphragm so that it can transfer the F over 2 force to the north and south walls. So if we have F over 2 applied on the roof, F over 4 is a shear force in the north wall and F over 4 is a south wall. Well, this is an approximation, which simply means that the in-plane shear in north and south walls each will be a quarter of the total wind pressure in the east-west direction. Considering the dimension of the building and the height of the wall above the ground, which is 18 minus 5 feet at 13 feet, the total force from the wind, say blowing on the wall, will be 13 feet times 54 times 20 is equal to 14,040 pounds. And this figure to the right shows you what we are talking about in terms of the height of the wall. And the 14 and a half is the height of the wall to the footing. Therefore, the moment applied on the footing would be 14 and a half times VW. However, when we compute the, uh, the shear force, we use 13 feet because that's what is above the ground. So the in-plane shear from wind in north and south wall would be a quarter of the value we just computed, so that's 3,510 pounds. Let's look at the axial load because of shear. There are two methods we could use. The shear force 
as we said, creates compression and tension axial loads in the wall because of the moment that we just described, the moment M. Since the shear force acts at the roof level and the height of the parapet wall is three and a half feet, as you can see in that figure to the right, we get 14 and a half feet for the computation of the moment. If we multiply that by 3,510, we get 50,895 feet per feet pounds. That's the, the moment. The distribution of the stress on the wall because of this moment is triangular as shown in this figure. Now, to the left, we have used the wall divided into strips of one foot each. And then we have discrete, disc, we have used, uh, sorry, we have used a discrete system to show these forces. You notice that the first strip has an F1, second one F2, third one F3, and all the way goes to zero because variation is linear. And then we get compression forces on the other side. Again, F1, F2, F3. Now, if you take a look at figure to the right, you will see how the moment is balanced by the moment of these forces. The distance of each force to the center of the wall is C equal to LW divided by 2 minus 0 0.5 feet for the first strip and reduced for the second strip and third and so on. Therefore, each force F1 F2, F3 can be obtained based on a common parameter, we call it PW. PW is the value of the F1, which is the largest compression force or tension force. F2, which is the force in the second strip, would be the same PW, however, multiplied by C minus 1 divided by C. And remember that C is equal to LW over 2 minus 0 0.5 feet. So using the discrete system of forces, the value of the maximum axial force, we call it F1 equal to PW, which is the force in the one foot of the width of the wall at the extreme end. We can easily compute PW by equilibrium. We have shown the same figure again here for reference. And writing the equilibrium, we have the moment equal to 2 times F1 times C plus F2 times C minus 1, etc. Now, why do we have a factor of 2? Because we got equal compression and equal tension forces. Then we convert everything in terms of PW and knowing that distance C is equal to 13 and a half feet, we have our equations written numerically, which relates the moment to PW. Now we plug for the moment that we found and from there we compute PW, which is plus or minus 376.1 foot per pound, uh, sorry, 376.1 pounds per foot, and the plus means compression, negative means tension. There is a simpler solution, which we call it an alternative approximate and conservative method. To use that method, the maximum axial load is also uh, considered one foot of the wall at each end. Therefore, F1 is equal to PW. And rather than using the previous process, we use the stress on the wall cross section. Consider this approximate method, the maximum stress on the wall because of moment M is M divided by S where S is a suction section modulus. Therefore, the force PW can be taken approximately at the stress multiplied by the area, which is H times one foot times M over S. The section modulus is H L W square over six. Therefore, we plug everything into equation for the PW, we get six M over L W squared. We plug numbers in there, we get 389.5 pounds per foot which is uh, fairly close to the previous value we found. Again, the figure shown to the right for your reference. And plus sign means compression, negative means tension. All right, now we put a table together to get our absolute maximum value for axial load and a shear load VU. 
This table has two columns. First column it shows the load combination. There are three columns actually. Second column shows the axial load PU. The third column shows V sub U. The load combinations are the four prevalent load combinations we talked about. On the axial load column, we have under 1.4D, we get 1.4 times 3,285. Of course, we don't have any shear force because of the dead load. The second combination, you notice, has 0.8W in it. Therefore, there is not only an axial load, because W also produce an axial load, it is also a shear force. You notice that the dead load and live load, of course, don't produce a shear force. Therefore, the shear force is 2,808. And we continue plugging numbers. The absolute maximum values are marked in red on the axial load column and on the shear column. So this analysis finally shows that our value is, for P sub U, 8,573.6. You notice that uh, we have put in the square plus or minus sign for the wind load because wind can blow in either direction. Therefore, we have to be careful for in that combination, we get two values, a plus value, 389.5 and the negative value. However, uh, it's obvious that the plus sign would create much larger value for the total axial load. So our axial load and shear values are now computed. These are the factored values, remember that. All right, in part B, we wanted to compute the piece of N. Please notice that the roof beams are designed with adequate support area where the axial load eccentricity is practically equal to zero. Therefore, E would be smaller than H over 6, and as such, the simplified equation for Vn can be used. And we already have used this equation in an example. And since we are considering only one foot of the length of the wall, so Ag is 12 times 12 inches times H, 132 square inches, we use k equal to 1, and L sub c is 18 feet, multiplied by 12, which is 216 inches. And if you recall, L sub c is overall height of the wall. So plugging the numbers in Pn, we end up with 135,787.5 pounds per foot. And using a resistance reduction factor of 0 0.65, we get 5 pn as 88,261.9 pounds per foot. Certainly, that's larger than 8,573.6 that we found earlier. Therefore, the wall thickness is acceptable. Finally, part C, we must first compute the shear resistance V sub C of the wall. And if you recall, V sub C is 2 lambda squared or prime sub C H D. Don't forget that D is equal to 80% of LW, and LW is the length of the wall. So plugging the numbers there, we get V sub C equal to 323,901.2 pounds. And if you recall, our VU is 5,616. Certainly, it is less than... 0.55 V sub C, and that means that the vertical is still would be rho LBH and rho L is 0.0012 from the table we had before. Remember, B is 12 inches, H is thickness, so we only need 0.16 square inches per foot of vertical steel. Horizontal is still computed the same way, the steel ratio is 0.002. And we need 0 0.26 square inches per foot. But again, notice that uh, we have 5 feet of the wall under the ground. Therefore, we must use 3 inches of concrete cover. So if we divide the total area of vertical steel by 2, because we need 2 curtain of reinforcement, each curtain would be 0 0.08 square inches per foot. And if you use number four bars, which has a cross-sectional area of 0 0.2 square inches, we are talking about the spacing equal to 30 inches. But that one exceeds 18 inches, so we have to limit it to 18. Therefore, our 
suggesting is to use a number 4 at 18 inches on centers for vertical bars on each face. Repeating a similar computation, for the horizontal steel on each face, we need 0.13 square inches per foot. And in this case, the our spacing would be 18 and a half inches. Again, that one exceeds 18 inches, so we ended up with 18 inches anyway. So it's a very nice design of number four, 18 inches on centers, both for the horizontal, vertical reinforcement, front face and back face. Three inches of a concrete cover. And it is, this is the detail of our reinforcement with three inches protection cover shown. Now let's examine distress conditions in concrete walls. The types of damage often observed in concrete walls are numerous and can happen because of one or more factors. In many situations, the damage may not be easily visible. And as such, some types of non-destructive tests or long-term monitoring may be necessary to find the cause and severity of a damaged wall. Most common damage areas or cases are various types of cracks, concrete spalls, different kinds of damage resulting from poor workmanship. The severity of cracks is determined by measuring their width and determining whether they are still growing. Most concrete walls exhibit cracks, however it is important to know what crack width is critical. Here is a table that provides a critical crack width. Please note that the current ACI 318 code does not directly address the threshold levels for cracks. The following limits in this table are from another document from ACI. It's ACI 224R01, which was published in 2001 and reapproved in 2008. For example, please notice that if you have seawater and seawater spray, wetting and drying conditions, the crack width is 0.006. And the uh, requirement is very severe if you have a water retaining a structure, which in that case is 0.004. These values are intended to be used as general guidelines. In certain specific cases, values different from these are recommended and can be used. For example, the National Ready Mix Association in their CIP7 document specify one eighth of an inch to be acceptable in most basement walls. Causes of cracks in concrete walls could be because of temperature variations, concrete creep and shrinkage, differential foundation settlement, heavy axial compression loads, excessive in-plane shear forces, excessive out-of-plane forces, a stress concentration at corners of openings, corrosion of rebars, expansive aggregates used in making concrete. The crack appearance can be patchy, vertical, diagonal, or horizontal. Generally, diagonal cracks can be attributed to a differential foundation settlement or a heavy in-plane shear force. Vertical cracks may be because of a heavy axial load, severe temperature variation, or expansive aggregates. Horizontal cracks are most probably due to an out-of-plane force, such as in cases where the concrete wall is under soil pressure. When rectangular openings are used in a concrete wall, corners are considered as regions of nonlinearity with the stress concentrations. If corners are not properly reinforced, diagonal cracks may develop. Let's show these cracks in this example. Here is a concrete wall with an opening. Diagonal cracks designated as number one could be because of foundation differential settlement or large in-plane shear. Horizontal cracks shown with number two could be because of a very large outer plane force. 
Diagonal cracks, as you can see at the corner of the openings, could be because of insufficient reinforcement, because of the nonlinearity that is happening and the stress concentration occurs at corner of openings. Vertical cracks, as shown with number four, could be because of lack of expansion joint and temperature variation, or large axial compression load, or even foundation differential settlement. And finally, patchy cracks could be because of expansive aggregates or creep and shrinkage or corrosion of rebars. This photo shows a vertical crack which was attributed to poor quality aggregates causing expansion in concrete. This is an example of a crack because of expansive aggregate. Crack width are measured using a simple crack comparator. That's a figure of one, which looks like a ruler. It has a, a size of a credit card, a piano wire, or more sophisticated devices called crack meters, such as those called the ruler type or the electronic ones. In this example, a crack meter is installed, measuring a crack. These things are left for extended period of time, especially to make sure that the crack is stable. Repair methods. The repair method may simply involve filling the crack with epoxy when the crack width is one eighth of an inch or smaller. More severe cracks may require removal of portions of the wall or entirely removing the wall and rebuilding it using proper design and detailing. However, before repair, we must make sure the crack width is not increasing with time, and this requires monitoring the crack width over an extended period of time to make sure the crack is not dynamic. One simple method is to use a patch of plaster on a small portion of the crack area. If the crack is dynamic, after some time, the crack will appear on the plaster as well. Another method is to use a crack meter as we described before. If a crack is dynamic, it will need to be controlled before a repair is done. For example, in the case of foundation settlements, the foundation can be stabilized by using underpinning before any crack repair is done. Concrete spalling is the loss of concrete cover. It happens in the form of patches where rebars become visible. It can happen because of inadequate concrete cover, corrosion of rebars which expand and put pressure on concrete, freeze and thaw cycles, poor workmanship during construction. In situations where the rebars are intact and without damage, the damaged area can be patched with quality concrete. For more extensive damage, these steps are often used. One, remove as much concrete needed in the damaged area to reach sound concrete. Continue removing additional concrete into sound concrete for a minimum of a quarter of an inch, however, not more than one inch. Two, clean and roughen surface and apply bounding compound on old sound concrete. Please note that some concrete repair experts believe bonding compound is not needed. It is a good idea to review the recommendation of the bonding compound manufacturer or consult with a concrete repair expert. 3. Use stainless steel concrete wedge anchor types or stainless steel pins 4 per square foot with a minimum embedment length of 1.5 inches. 4. Remove all loose and corroded and pitted steel, clean area, use new rebars if needed, overlapping with old ones, and apply a corrosion inhibiting agent to all exposed rebars. 5. Fill area after concrete removal and surface preparation with non-shrink or quick set concrete or short creek. So this figure shows these various steps. Step one is remove as much concrete needed in damaged area as we talked about. Step two is clean and roughen surface. Step three is use stainless 
steel concrete wedge anchors, as we talked about. And step four, remove all loose and corroded and pitted steel. And finally, step five was to fill area with uh, non shrink or quick set concrete. Poor workmanship may appear in the form of cracks, voiding concrete, crumbled concrete, or compromised compression strength. Examples of poor workmanship are too little or too much vibration at the time of concrete work, lack of expansion joints, low quality aggregates, substandard concrete mix, inadequate water cement ratio, contaminated aggregates, water with too much salt content. Removing forms too early and inadequate forms to support wet concrete. It is important to have a good quality control in place at the time of repair work to reduce concrete damage because of these and other factors that are related to poor workmanship. Design in seismic areas. When concrete walls are subject to seismic forces, provisions for design in seismic areas will also need to be followed to ensure strength and ductility requirements are met. Please review these requirements in the ACI 2014 entitled Building Code Requirements for a Structural Concrete and Commentary. Thank you for watching this video.